All right, everyone. So we have the first set of talks for the day. I have the pleasure of introducing Kamel Ghali. He's a, a veteran in the cybersecurity community. Uh, he's also supporting many other um, community-based um, projects like SAE, ASRG, Car Hacking Village. He's also um, currently working for White Motion, but I'll let him introduce himself um, a little bit more in detail. Or did you already have that planned in the video? That that's in the video. So I can right. just, yeah. So we we actually I recorded the because this talk is going to include a short technical demonstration, and the equipment that I use is it's not a lot of equipment. It's just a couple of Raspberry Pi devices, but we also use them for training uh, at work. I needed to bring them into the office again, so I can't do the demonstration live. But that's why we uh, did a pre-recording version just in case, because I felt something like this might come up. So you guys will get to watch uh, me from about a week and a half ago, uh, walk you through uh, the talk, give a brief introduction to myself, and uh, and then just yeah, go into the demonstration itself. But uh, I'll be watching with you guys, but my camera will be off, so no director's cut. Um, but yeah, I'll be around for questions and uh, for networking after the talk as well. So don't feel like you're missing out just because it's not a live demonstration. Great, man. Thank you so much for doing this and uh, looking forward to your talk, okay? Of course, my pleasure. Let's get things started, huh? Okay, here we go. Thank you all for having me. Uh, and once again, thank you guys for coming to the Secure Our Streets conference hosted by ASRG. Uh, I believe this is the first one and we're hoping to have many more in the future. So thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Kamel and today I'm going to be giving a short demonstration of some hands-on automotive exploitation. Uh, it's going to be a very basic buffer overflow uh, demonstration targeting a Bluetooth interface. Uh, this is by no means any groundbreaking research. And this is going to be a kind of an attack that's been well documented in the past in automotive systems and otherwise. But I still think it's uh, very beneficial to just kind of see how that kind of attack works in a real demonstration. So very quickly, just want to go over um, the who am I, right, who I am, and, and why I'm presenting here. Um, my name is, of course, is, is Kamal, Kamal Ghali. I'm an automotive cybersecurity technology architect at White Motion, which is a subsidiary of the international automotive tier one supplier Morelli. Uh, White Motion is a special team within Morelli that specializes in automotive cybersecurity, carrying out penetration tests for our parent company and external companies, uh, and contributing to the automotive security industry by providing training in car hacking and legislation and standards compliance. Uh, I'm an active member of the ASRG, as hopefully you can, you can see here. And I love participating in the car hacking community, even beyond my professional duties. Uh, and my recent areas of interest include Bluetooth, of course, this is kind of one of the basic building blocks of today's talk, uh, USB and uh, RF communications as well. And, um, you know, sometimes occasionally tweaking with very obscure Taiwanese microcontrollers, but uh, that's just kind of uh, related to one of my hobbies, which is actually uh, you know, a couple of those are listed down there below. But anyway, uh, enough about me, let's go on to the objectives of today's talk. So uh, I'd like to say that the overall objective isn't to show some kind of new novel attack targeting some automotive system. This is just going to be a very basic demonstration of a buffer overflow attack, which is a common type of attack uh, used in information security, but targeted at a Bluetooth interface. And Bluetooth is relevant for this kind of conference because Bluetooth is used in cars, as you might know. But quick uh, table of contents, we're going to have a very short explanation of Bluetooth from a technical perspective and its place in the automotive landscape, uh, a short overview of what exactly uh, buffer overflow vulnerability is, and then we're going to have the real-time demo that I mentioned previously. And then I'll, of course, have time afterwards uh, for, for Q&A. So, a very quick introduction to Bluetooth. You probably already know what Bluetooth is completely independent from any technical understanding of what Bluetooth really is on the inside, how it works from a technical perspective. And that's perfectly you know, understandable. Most things in the world aren't developed to be analyzed by engineers. They're meant to be you know, given to regular people who don't need to understand them uh, at the very low level. But Bluetooth is in your phone, it's in your headphones, it's probably in your 
you know, maybe in your microwave or your refrigerator or your washing machine, honestly, uh, and a lot of industrial sensors you might use at work, and it's most certainly inside your car. And this is because Bluetooth is a very popular cable replacement technology that's found in almost all IoT devices worldwide. It's one of the most popular ones, if not the most popular one. Um, it's designed to simplify short range communications uh, for wireless devices, but providing a uniform framework for connecting the devices to one another. It operates in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range, which is very similar or more or less identical to that of uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, of course, can also operate in five gigahertz, um, but as a result, you can often find Bluetooth and Wi-Fi chips bundled together. So in cars, right, talking about how Bluetooth is used in cars, let's talk about first what Bluetooth is used for overall, right? In general, Bluetooth applications are for, like I said, short range communications between wireless devices. So things like industrial sensors that need to send data, for example, uh, the measuring of the humidity of some area, you know, once every hour, so on and so forth. We're seeing that with Bluetooth low energy, these kinds of long term periodic sending uh, type of sensors are actually getting very comfortable with Bluetooth low energy because it is very efficient at saving energy when it comes to reporting something. If you don't have a lot of information to share, Bluetooth low energy does a great job of letting you share that information with a maybe central controlling unit that can actually receive that and do some more heavy processing. But in more consumer electronic sense, right, you have your cell phone here, you might connect to your headphones over Bluetooth and it can stream audio for you. You can actually even uh, send files over Bluetooth, right? You can share a picture or an image or a video file with, uh, with a friend nearby just by sending it over Bluetooth. And over time, as Bluetooth's bandwidth has increased, that's become uh, even more you know, feasible. You know, in the past, you might be able to send it over Bluetooth, but if it was a file bigger than a couple of megabytes, it might take you 10, 15 minutes, right? But when it comes to cars, uh, it's usually found in the infotainment system of the vehicle. The infotainment system being your, your head unit or the kind of consumer facing part of the smart vehicle, right? This is the part that's going to be next to your dashboard. When you sit in next to your steering wheel, you can control what radio station you're listening to. You could connect your phone to it and play music through it. This is one of the big uses of Bluetooth and automotive. Uh, but there are other uses, for example, importing your phone book right? And hands-free calling, right? Hands-free calling was probably the first implementation uh, designed specifically for this kind of automotive environment. It wasn't specifically designed for cars, but it was very useful in cars in the early 2000s because you could be on the road and have your phone connected to your car. And if you got a phone call, you didn't have to, you know, kind of fumble for your phone, say, oh, hello, hey, yeah, no, what's up? You could just push a button on your, on your, uh, on your steering wheel, a lot of cars will have actually dedicated buttons to answer phones, right? Uh, and that kind of also transfers into, well, what if you could import your phone book? So a lot of times the Bluetooth will be used to import your contacts, your text message history from your phone into the vehicle. So that's a bit more sensitive information, right? And then we're seeing that you know, recently even, uh, as has been shown in a couple of different security research publications, a Bluetooth has been used to perform more safety critical things. Uh, safety critical in the sense that someone might get hurt or your car might get stolen, not in the same sense that a car operation safety critical. But things like using Bluetooth low energy to update the firmware on a key fob for a Tesla Model X. This is something that uh, some research was published about in the last couple of years, showing that they were able to abuse some, how should I say, misconfigurations in the device's Bluetooth implementation and actually copy a key to unlock the car and at the end of the day, drive away with it. This detailed research is available online. Of course, I'm not gonna be talking too much about that. I don't have enough time to do any case studies today, um, but just to give you an idea of how Bluetooth and automotive has been the target of security research, uh, it'll help you kind of frame what we're gonna show later on uh, into, into the big picture, right? It'll help, its, help it find its way into the big picture. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of research about that available. If you have any questions or recommendations on something to read regarding Bluetooth and automotive, uh, feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to share with you. So uh, what is a buffer overflow vulnerability, right? This is going to be the next short piece we talk about here. A buffer overflow is a kind of software vulnerability that can arise from improper coding practices and the use of insecure functions. So it has to do with the way that these functions or these programs access memory 
uh, on the device processing them, right? How they access memory, how they read and write to their to their memory or the stack or the RAM. And it occurs when the proper cautions aren't taken, when code that interacts with memory takes in data from another source. So uh, for example, when data that is larger than the buffer allocated to receive it is written to memory, sometimes if you, like I said, if you don't have the proper checks in place, unrelated parts of memory can accidentally be overwritten. And this can have a lot of different consequences from either just the program crashing to nothing happening at all and things more or less seeming fine uh, to, you know, in very, you know, well developed scenarios, you can actually have a custom payload be written into that memory. And then perhaps the program counter upon returning doesn't return to the right address. And you can influence the, uh, the operation of the program in ways that wasn't really intended. So, so basically, the idea is, whatever memory you have stored adjacent to that buffer might get overwritten. And depending on the structure of your program, uh, you can have some unintended consequences, right? And that's kind of how what I'm going to demonstrate uh, with the demo later on uh, in just a couple of couple of minutes. But, you know, C and C++ are the two languages where this happens most often as they don't have uh, built in protections against this kind of attack that some other uh, more modern languages might have. And, and obviously how modern they are is only one part of the equation, but just the way they were designed kind of left this as one big concern when coding in C and C++, which, is, which are both still very common in automotive, especially due to their efficiency. But there's a lot to do with buffer overflows, and I'm doing a very poor job of uh, simply summarizing what exactly they are and how they're relevant in security. But nonetheless, you know, please forgive me, uh, we are going to have a quick uh, demonstration of this now because uh, I did just want to give a very short for, short demo of this. But of course, before we actually get into that, very short disclaimer. Uh, one, the vulnerable program that I'm going to be using is intentionally made to be very insecure. Uh, I'm not doing any pairing checks. I'm not having, obviously, the way the program is coded, I have intentionally included uh, a buffer overflow that could lead to, you know, gaining root access, right? That's, that's kind of what the demo is going to be. It's very intentionally poorly designed just for the purpose of a demonstration showing how a program can react outside of what you expect it to. This is in no way reflective of Bluetooth applications used in modern vehicles. I'm not basing this attack on vulnerabilities I've seen in customer products or any other OEM or company's products. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not out to take any shots at any company for, oh, they programmed this wrong. And that's not the purpose of this uh, talk. We're just going to be showing a quick demonstration. So please understand this is all created expressly for the purpose of this contained uh, environment, per se, right? The, the environment of this talk, that is. So what exactly do I have set up for the demo? So it's a very simple program meant to mimic a very basic access control. Right. Uh, it could be, you know, something for like a, a server or a lock. Maybe you want to program, you know, a lock that unlocks when you enter the correct password over Bluetooth or something. Right. Um, the basic access control is guarding something that is important. And it doesn't matter what it is, but in this case, it's just very vaguely defined root privilege. Right. <laughs> root privileges. So the idea is, is you have a device that is waiting for someone to over Bluetooth send uh, the correct password. If the correct password is sent, then root privilege will be granted. Let's not worry about what that means exactly. That's not the point, right? But if the wrong password is sent, then you know obviously nothing should happen. You shouldn't be able to go up to a device and put the wrong password and be granted the access that you would need the correct password for. This is pretty pretty easy to understand, right? You know, if I don't have the password, I shouldn't be able to get whatever is behind the lock, right? Uh, but, you know, oftentimes, you know, the world doesn't actually work out that way. And this is why secure coding practices are important. So uh, I have put together a little chart. We're going to do a couple of trials, just three. Uh, the first one, I'm going to send the incorrect password to the device. Right? And we're going to observe the outcome of that incorrect submission. Uh, we're going to send the correct password. And we're going to see you know, what happens in that case. And we're going to send something else and then see if we can't trick it into giving us root access without actually having the password, right? So I put together this chart showing the expected outcome for each trial. And then we're going to observe the outcome of each trial uh, individually. So give me one second. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that 
my uh, terminal windows are showing here. So I'll hide this. Okay, here we go. So the, the setup I have for this is very basic. I've got two Raspberry Pis in the other room. And I have an SSH window uh, into either one of them. Uh, so this one over here on the left, I don't know if you can tell which one is on the left. Can you see my cursor? I think you can. Okay, cool. So <laughs> this is the server. And on the right side is the client. So the right side, this is going to be the device we're attacking with. And this is the device that's going to be attacked. So uh, very simply, I'm going to go ahead and start the server here. It's going to be a sudo slash SOS uh, demo server. There we go. And you can see right now, it's just waiting for the password to be submitted over Bluetooth. Like I said, it's intentionally made very secure. I just did this very quick and dirty. It took me about three or four hours to put this whole shebang together. I, I didn't spend that much time on it. But uh, it's just waiting for a password to be sent over Bluetooth. There's no pairing checks. There's no encryption or anything going on in the background. It's just waiting for a key to be submit over, over Bluetooth. And over here, I have three programs written, uh, written in C and compiled, of course. Uh, and one of them is going to be the incorrect uh, password attempt. So that's the first one we're going to do, right? So sudo slash so as demo incorrect. And when I press this, we're going to actually see the password that gets sent to the server device. All right, so when I do this, if all goes well, typical live demo problems. Oh, here we go. So the password sent, I tried to send hello with a, an exclamation mark, right? Uh, unfortunately, that is the wrong password. And the program just kind of quits out. Right? Nothing happens. And that's good, right? That's what we expect to happen when someone gets the wrong password, you expect that things just kind of end. You don't want anything else to happen, right? So that's going to be the first trial done. And we've observed that our outcome is the same as the expected outcome. Let's go ahead and do the second trial now. So the second trial is going to be, uh, once again, we're going to start that server. Oh, oops. And over here, we're going to now send the correct password. I had it written in the slide before the correct password is uh hello kamel right my name just is a very basic key for this uh highly secure root privilege program right so sos demo correct and this time let's see what gets sent over all right here we go come on do your thing okay wonderful so we received the password hi kamel yeah hello hello to you too uh, and that is the correct password and we can see now that because we submitted the correct password <laughs> root privileges, right? whatever that means, <laughs> uh, have been given to the user, which is awesome. We got root privilege. Well done. We rooted the device but with the correct password, to be fair. Uh, but now, now we're going to do uh, something a little bit more, more hacksery. But let's first, first of all, go back and update our, uh, our chart to show that we have successfully uh, put in the correct password, right? So good job. The expected value meets the observed value or the other way around, I suppose. All right, finally, we're going to have one more trial. And this is going to be the trial where we actually uh, exploit the buffer overflow. I didn't show the source code for the program running the server just because it, it's really embarrassing. I'm not a very good programmer. But regardless, we're going to start the server one last time. And this time we're going to send not the correct password, but we're going to send a very special payload to uh, see if we can get the door to open anyway, right? So sudo dot slash slash demo. It's very cool. So we send this and what password are we sending? Well, I'm sending a bunch of H's, right? It's just <laughs> like if you were laughing in an online chat room, I know some languages use HHH as their like laughing sound uh, in, in like text format. Um, however, it's the wrong password. But I got root privileges anyway, right? Now, how does that work? Well, basically, uh, and it's, it's a very embarrassing program. Like I said, it's very you know, intentionally insecure. But the variable that stored the, I guess, the result of the password check was adjacent to the variable that the actual password received was being stored in. So what happens, right? The buffer initially allocated for this password upon reception wasn't big enough to hold this plethora of H's that we sent over Bluetooth. So what ends up happening is that the value of the is the password correct variable gets written due to not having any checks on the size of the input. It gets overwritten. And then later on in the program, when we go to check, okay, 
is the flag for correct password set? Well, it is because I unintentionally, right? Unintentionally, we hacked it, right? We're, we're hackers. We exploited the system, right? We've written over that value. And now you can see, well, we got our root privileges. Awesome. Well done, guys. You guys are hackers. So now we can successfully uh, go back to the PowerPoint presentation and show that once again, reality is not always as easy as we would like it to be. So we've successfully compromised the system. We've gotten root privileges, whatever that means, right? It's, don't worry about it. But we've shown that we can, without the correct password, get the root privileges accessed. So in conclusion, the buffer overflow attack clearly invoked unintended functionality from the target. This unintended functionality being the locking of those root privileges. Again, this vulnerability was an issue with the application running on the target itself, not the actual Bluetooth implementation. This is an important distinction I like to make. We didn't attack the Bluetooth protocol implementation on the target. We just used it as it was. The issue in this case was actually the program on the other side of this. If you think of Bluetooth as like a, like a tunnel through which data can be passed, right? On each side, you have an application sending data. My server application and my client application. The server application didn't have the proper checks in place to check the data that it was receiving over this Bluetooth connection. And that's what led to this buffer overflow uh, vulnerability being exploited. Not to say you can't attack the Bluetooth protocol itself. This is an entirely different area of study. Uh, and it has been, you know, of course, the target of many different pieces of security research over the years. So if that's something you find a little bit to be more interesting, then I would definitely recommend you go ahead and, and look into that as well. But uh, I am all out of clever things to say. So I'm going to go ahead and just conclude with a very uh, heartfelt thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, my socials are up there on the screen, my email address for both ASRG and my employer. So if you want to send me a direct email to ask me a question or just criticize me for giving such a uh, half-baked presentation, then uh, I, I welcome your feedback. Um, otherwise, if you have any any questions or, or so on and so forth, you just want to connect and maybe keep up to date with other places I present or I don't know really what else you might want to do. My, my LinkedIn uh, name is just my name. You can look me up. It's not a very common name, so you shouldn't have a hard time finding me, uh, I promise. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. And if you have any questions, I will definitely be available afterwards uh, to answer those. So thanks. Is my video working? Okay, we're good. Yeah. Okay, awesome. It is, first of all, Kamel, thank you very much for giving that presentation. Even though it was video, actually, it was amazing. So I, I always love to see these types of things, you know, examples of real kind of things that you do in a penetration testing. Um, if I don't see any specific questions in the chat, but I would have one question myself for people that really want to start doing this stuff. You know, where, where do you start? How do you get this knowledge? How do you uh, play with Bluetooth? What do you need tools wise and so on? What helped you get into this uh, specific expertise? Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. Bluetooth is very like ubiquitous in people's everyday lives. Like every day I leave the house, you know, I turn on my, my Bluetooth on my phone. I connect my, my headphones. I listen to my music on the train. Um, but interestingly, you know, learning about how to use Bluetooth is, is a little bit difficult and th there are resources available, but a lot of them are quite dated. Uh, and, and some of the really good ones are a little bit old, but still very valuable. Um, there is a book that I read. Uh, it's available online for free. It's called, as simply as it, as it gets, an introduction to Bluetooth programming with uh, BlueZ. BlueZ is the uh, Linux, the official Linux Bluetooth stack, right? So this is a book about programming Linux applications, or sorry, Bluetooth applications with Linux. This is a really great video. Um, I've actually, uh, I've given talks in the past where I kind of just very briefly go over Bluetooth in automotive and uh, share some some more resources that I can't really uh, think of off the top of my head at this moment, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, with ASRG, I've given a talk uh, at the the Car Hacking Village at DEF CON. I think uh, when we the first year when we did it um, remotely, I did like a Bluetooth 101 for for automotive, and that should be available for free on YouTube somewhere. Uh, if, if 
if it's not up there, just send me a message and I'll happily dig it out from whatever unlisted playlist it's hidden in and share it. Uh, but I, there are a couple more resources for getting um, familiar with Bluetooth. And But if you're, uh, you know, a team manager and you have a, a team of people that would like to learn how to do Bluetooth you know, programming or even, you know, security testing uh, and you have the budget for it and you want a more hands on guided experience, uh, I am a. I suppose, Bluetooth trainer uh, in my own right uh, as part of my official duties at my company. So if you hit us up, we'll happily be able to uh, give you a quick course. And uh, this is we do this in person and, and online as well. But we, we can do completely remotely is what we're trying to do. I've been kind of working on that recently. That's what I spent all day doing, matter of fact. Um, but yeah, no, sales pitch is done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Kamel, thank you so much. And you're going to be available in the the tables to discuss a little bit more uh, yes. with anyone that's interested. Uh, I do see one question, but we got to move on to the next talk. So, um, thank you very much once again. And yeah, no, uh, of course, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And, and yeah, like you said, I'll be in the uh, the networking table area for about uh, another 20, 30 minutes at most. So if anyone has any questions or, or wants to just get in touch or, or tell me I did a terrible job, like I'm, I'm all yours. Right. <laughs> Love how frank you are, man. Uh, <laughs> as always, thank you very much. We'll see you guys at the tables and get ready for the next topic. Thanks. Yeah.